Hello, everyone, and welcome to Locked on Indians. I'm your host, Jeff Ellis. want to remind everyone that our latest our show today, I should say, is brought to you by Locker Room. Uh, I'm typically on there Saturday nights if you want to come on and talk about the Indians. We have a very special guest today. Uh, we have you. If you're watching the video one, you might recognize the face. We have Carlos <laughs> Palazzo from Baseball America. Uh, like I said, if you watch the MLB draft, Carlos is there. You see him. You see him talk about the prospects. You know he knows his stuff very well. And this is doubly fun because I've had, I was saying beforehand, like probably about a hundred interactions with Carlos. And this is our first time actually chatting and, you know, seeing each other's face, hearing each other's voices. So I, it's the height of the season. Thanks for coming on uh, and putting us in your extremely busy schedule. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Like you said, we've, seems like we've known each other for a while, but it's nice to finally uh, get on a video call and chat. So looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. No, it's, it, I find it a lot of fun. It's just fun to talk baseball with people and uh, with as crazy as the past year has been, uh, the virtual forum is, uh, it's been kind of nice in any form to get to talk to baseball. So it's, uh, it's great to have you here to kind of drill into your wealth of knowledge uh, right off the bat. So for people who are listening to my podcast, who know a little bit about the draft, they probably know about the Vandy arms, mm -hmm. but is it safe to say right now that for all the, not to say they're overhyped because I don't think that's the case, but to say that for all the talk about the Vandy arms, is it now the four, depending on how you look at Brady House, the four prep shortstops that are kind of the talk? Are those the players that I, I feel like I'm hearing the most about at this point in time? Yeah, well, I think I think you're right to say that they're they're not overhyped generally, but I do think their hype exceeds kind of where they're at with these shortstops. I think I think the shortstops are probably just underhyped. I mean, they're all in a similar tier of talent. Uh, really, throughout this entire process, we've had four guys, maybe now it's five guys who are kind of in this top tier of players, and no one really has a consensus on who's the top guy. Some people might like Jack Leiter, some people might like Kumar Rocker, some people might like Marcelo Meyer, the high school shortstop out of California, and some people might prefer uh, Texas shortstop Jordan Lawler. So those are typically the guys that get talked to, about at the top, and I understand why the Vanderbilt arms are very popular for people who maybe aren't as uh, in deep in the draft, just because you can see them every weekend. They play for a very prominent college program. I mean, Kumar Rocker is, is perhaps the most famous college baseball player we've had in years. Maybe Jack Leiter is, is kind of at that same level, given what he's done this year. So I understand it. But I do think there is a lot of uh, attention for the high school shortstops on the team side who are picking at the top of the draft. In our last mock draft, I think we had three high school shortstops going with the first three picks. Um, and we've heard that that a lot of the teams out there are bearing down on those guys. And I think in addition to the two high school shortstops I've already mentioned, Brady House out of Georgia and Khalil Watson out of North Carolina are two guys who were probably going to be off the board very quickly. I mean, this this high school shortstop class is one of the best. It's easily the best that I've ever seen, and it's got a chance to be one of the best of all time in the draft. I mean, if, if four guys, if four high school shortstops go in the top 10 picks, that'll be the first time that's happened in the Baseball America era, which goes back to 1981. Uh, and, and prior to that, it was just kind of a different draft environment where college players were not as uh, heavily sought after as they are at this point. So it's a very strong year for the high school shortstop class, but we don't have the kind of locked in number one prospect in this year's class that we have the past three drafts. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, you know, you talk about like history. I know this is a Locked on Indians podcast, but one of my favorite like random historical facts is that in the entire history of the draft and we're what like over 50 years now the detroit tigers in the first round have drafted a shortstop twice one of those being scott moore who the minute he was drafted was moved to third base uh i know you know i've talked to some people who have some tigers connections that you know mayor is the guy they love but house is also there and house may move to third uh it, it is to me very interesting the idea that the tigers would go shortstop, but doesn't it, I, I guess I'm, you know, without giving too much information, uh, the high school shortstop seems to be a position that I've heard heavily just when my minor chats there, which would be, like I said, going against 50 years of history. Yeah, no, I, I think it, it is interesting. I, I mean, I could see a pitcher going in that spot, but it does seem like we've heard more bats there than, than pitching. And there's still plenty of time for things to change. So we'll see what happens. But I'm also curious if, if some of the financial, um, like underslotting kind of gets in the way there and teams try to get creative just because there is no clear order of how to line up the talent. So teams just go search for a haircut and put that money to use later in the draft, because I do think it's a very deep draft class. 
while maybe some teams are are underwhelmed with the the amount of impact talent at the very top, I think this is one of the better draft classes that I've covered in terms of depth. And that's partially because it was a five round draft last year when the 2020 class was, was already strong on depth and many of those players are back. Um, and there's just so, so little consensus this year because of how the draft cycle has played itself out that it's really, I think from a fan perspective, it's probably going to be one of the more fun drafts to watch just cause I'm, I'm assuming things are going to be all over the place and pretty crazy, but we'll see. Now you, you talk about consensus. Uh, is it fair to say that, there's only maybe two spots of consensus right now, top college bat and top prep arm. Are those, do you feel like those are consensus with, uh, with the players there or, uh, you know, is there anything else that you think is consensus? But I, I think, think as you said that. No, I think that's, that's pretty fair. I think, I think most people would have Henry Davis out of Louisville as the top college hitter in the class. I mean, he's had a pretty tremendous season and really from the jump, he was performing at a high level, showing power, uh, doesn't show a lot of swing and miss. Um, defensively as a catcher, he's got close to an elite arm. I think that teams might be split on his defense, but I do think that for the most part, and and you're probably never going to get a a year where every single person in the industry agrees on one thing. Like I'm sure there's a a scout or a team out there who might prefer um, a Sal Frelick to Henry Davis for whatever reason. But I think largely the industry does see Henry Davis as a top um, college bat. and, And like you were saying, the top high school pitcher in the class, Pretty cl- clearly this spring and pretty early on became Jackson Job. Uh, after last summer, it was Florida prep right-hander Andrew Painter. Uh, but Job out of Oklahoma really has has taken a step forward this spring. Um, the, the people who like him see three plus pitches across the board, really innate feel for spinning a breaking ball. I think probably one of the better prep breaking balls since Carter Stewart a few years ago. Um, so he he's kind of stepped into that position. So I think those are pretty fair claims to say that that those two positions you can have some sort of an industry consensus on. Whereas with, with college pitching, maybe it's a little bit dicier with high school bats. There are a number of options who you could make a claim for. So I I think that's a good, a fair point. Something else just is someone who likes to dig into the minutia and the history of it. You know, you mentioned Cleo Watson, who's kind of like the, you know, the, the last of that tier of shortstops. I feel like that's something, you know, very recent where, Cleo Watson, just due to his size, would have never been considered a top 10 pick because he mm-hmm. is not the biggest guy. And now we see, you know, Indians fans know that size doesn't necessarily mean you can't hit for power. Jose Ramirez is all of 5'8", if yep. that. And Francisco Lindor was not the biggest shortstop and he had 40 home runs. So if you can just talk about like Watson's general tools uh, at the, my very first, I always do my way too early mock. And the only picks I've ever gotten right is the White Sox because <laughs> I can just, I did it back to back years because they are so easy to, to do that. But my way too early mock back then, I had uh, Cleo Watson to the Indians and talked about how he was their ideal infielder. Unfortunately, if you're an Indians fan, everyone else kind of woke up since September, got more views and he has been on that steady climb. So uh, just if you don't mind talking about Watson for people who are not as familiar. Yeah, I mean, I've talked with some people who think Watson might have the best, if you just grade him out across the board, I've talked with some people who think Watson might be the most talented player in the class just based on the tools. I mean, I think Jordan Lawler is a very impressive athlete, but it's certainly possible that Khalil Watson is the more explosive athlete of all these shortstops we're talking about. He is the smallest of them, so maybe you don't project as much power as you could with Brady House or Marcelo Meyer down the line, Uh, but he has some thunder in his bat. I mean, he's got pretty electric bat speed, Again, some some scouts I've talked to have said he has the best bat speed in the high school class. He was an excellent performer last summer. He he squared up some of the better pitchers in the class, including some really tough left-handed at bats uh, that he he drove with authority. So that was really impressive for him. I think teams that are pretty model heavy are going to like a lot of what he brings to the table in terms of bat to ball ability, performance against uh, some of the top pitchers in the class last summer, um, and his age. He's he's fairly young for the class. Um, so I think you put all that together, his running ability, uh, he's got all the tools that you would want for a player to stick in the middle of the infield, uh, as a shortstop, I think probably with, with any high school shortstop, there's, there's a little bit more refinement that you're going to want to see, but nothing that you would project him to, to have to move off the position unless he was competing with some gold glove shortstop and it just was a better fit for your team. So uh, there are a lot of traits to like, and I do think that to your point about, um, smaller players being inside the top 10. We've got a couple of them this year in in Khalil and with Sal Frelick, both who are listed at five foot nine. Neither of these guys are, are big guys, but it does seem like teams don't really care that much anymore. Size is not 
uh, prohibitive to these teams, especially when uh, you might even have more conviction in their ability to hit. If you're a shorter armed guy, you don't have a long swing. Maybe there are fewer holes in your swing. Um, and given the way that power is playing in the big leagues, you don't have to be a big beefy slugger to hit for average power and, and even more in some cases. So I really think that with Khalil, there's there's no real hole in his game to speak of. If you do want to pick nits, you would say, well, he, he's not going to be a massive power guy, but I mean, he doesn't have to be a massive power guy to be a very good offensive uh, performer. He, he can run, uh, he can hit, certainly he can hit for gap power. I mean, he's hitting for power now in high school. Um, how much you think he's going to have in the future maybe is, is up for debate, but it's at least going to be solid power. Um, and if you're a, if you're an above average or plus hitter with average power, 70 grade speed and premium defense, that's, that's a really good player. No, absolutely. And it's one of those things like, I feel like more and more I stop looking at height and I start looking at, you know, you talk about bat speed and then just when you can find those max exit velocities, uh, it's, it, it's, it's interesting just how much has changed. Like I mm -hmm. started, I started heavy doing this like in 2011. And I remember writing about like the 2011, 2012 Indians drafts about them targeting undersized players as a market inefficiency. And here we are like a decade later. And it's like <laughs> now the rest of the market's like, yeah, yeah, we don't care. It, you, you just talked about South Frey, like, uh, what if he's even smaller than Watson? I I just love the athletic profile. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, we we see a lot of quarterbacks, and he was the All State quarterback. I can't remember the last time. I'm sure some of the Canadian players, of course, but the the All State hockey player as well. And I'm very curious to see like does that translate into like balance and mm -hmm. like mechanic? You know, it's it's just so many of those parts and pieces. Uh, with Sal Freilich, how do you feel? He's interesting in the regards that like I've seen him in some places like sixth. I've seen him in some places like 16th. Mm -hmm. What do you think the the disconnect with him is as there there does seem to be a variance of opinions with him? Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, uh, if, if he goes 16, uh, whoever whoever takes him there, I don't remember off the top of my head who's picking 16. Uh, the Brewers are 15. Who's right after that? The Reds are 18. Uh, I can't think of 16 or 17. If the oh, Marlins get right. Frelick, if the Marlins, I just looked it up. If the Marlins <laughs> get Frelick at 16, that's a phenomenal pick in my mind. I think he's, I think he certainly belongs in the top 10. We have him ranked in the top 10 because the scouting industry has given us the feedback that he belongs there. I, I do think the question and what probably limits him from being in, in this elite top tier is, is the question of impact. I think just based on where they are in their stages right now, you maybe can be a little bit more optimistic for the sort of power that Khalil is going to develop as he continues to grow and, and develop physically. But Tal is still a smaller guy. He's shorter. He, he's pretty well filled out for his frame. So he's not like a super skinny guy. Uh, and he does have some power to the pull side now. I think it's a question of how much power is he going to have um, in the pro game when he's using a wood bat. Um, he has a tendency to get a little bit slappy at times, which has worked for him. He can, he can push the ball the other way and use his... Uh, double plus speed to turn singles into doubles and things like that. But again, when you kind of break down the tools, I think he's a, he's a plus or better runner. I think he's going to be a really good defender in center field. He, he has the athleticism that you would want for a premium defender. Doesn't have the biggest arm, but you don't really need that in center field with the running ability and the glove work that he can provide there. He's another guy who kind of like Henry Davis has really good pure bat to ball skills. I think he is a little bit more, uh, aggressive in terms of chasing outside of the zone than Davis is. So that might be another nit you could pick with him. Maybe you think that better pitchers will um, be able to expose that in his game. But again, at the same time, I think he's found success with hitting pitches outside of the zone and jumping on pitches that are not necessarily uh, like firing off your A swing every time. If he gets better at doing that, I think he can be a much more efficient hitter in the pro game when maybe he's not able to kind of slap out of the zone stuff around as easily as he's doing right now. But I think that, especially considering the college hitting class there this year, Frelick would be, I mean, personally for me, he'd probably be my second uh, college bat after Henry Davis. And I think there are, there are probably scouts who believe that as well, but you get into the Matt McLean at UCLA tier, you get into Colton Kowser at Sam Houston state. Uh, so there are a couple of guys who are maybe more jumbled once you get to kind of the second tier of players in this class, but I'm very high on Frelick. And I think maybe what separates him uh, or, or what excites me about him is just that competitive nature that he has. You mentioned the multi-sport background out of high school. Every person that I've talked to that knows him personally, coaches, scouts who are really close with him, just rave about his his makeup and his his intensity, how he plays the game. I just think he's going to get every last bit um, 
of talent out of himself. And I think he's going to, he's going to make the most of his tool set and then some, I think he's really that type of player. Um, yeah, I, I'm really excited for whatever team gets him. I think he's going to be a very fun player to watch in addition to a very good one. No, I, I definitely agree with you. I think the four college players you named is the exact order I have them in. So I'm, I'm right there with you with Frey like it too. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here, talk about our sponsors and I'm going to come back and, uh, Ask Carlos a little bit about the uh, the Ohio kids. It's the you know I I told as I talked about on the podcast I moved out of Ohio two years ago and of course uh, they proceed to have the greatest class I feel like in the last ten years. So I'm going to ask Carlos all about some of those talented players, uh, specifically some MAC players in a second. But let's talk about RockAuto.com. They've been our sponsor for over a year. You know by now it's a family owned b- business serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. Go to rockauto.com to shop for auto and body parts for hundreds of manufacturers. They have everything from engine control modules and brake parts to tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. Whether it's for your classic or daily driver, get everything you need in a few easy clicks delivered directly to your door. The rockauto.com catalog is unique and remarkably easy to navigate. Quickly see all the parts available for your vehicle and choose the brands specifications, and prices you prefer. Best of all, prices at rockauto.com are always reliably low and the same for professionals and do-it-yourselfers. Why spend up to twice as much for the same parts? Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in their house. Did you hear about us, Box? Right locked on Indians, locked on MLB, son. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com. Okay, so there's the so and the okay, which lets all of my listeners know I've been doing this for 500 episodes. We did our 500th episode last week. I still can't break that. Uh, I, uh, every- <laughs> I have a tendency to use the word like as a filler a lot, so I'm right there with you. <laughs> it's But it's like every time we do an ad read, it's always like, um, it's okay. Mm-hmm. So, and then, so every, I, it's, I guess it's my way of letting people know, <laughs> oh, okay, I can go back to that point. Uh, when, exactly. You know, I understand. I, I listen to podcasts. I skip the ads as well. I understand. <laughs> uh, but, you know, as I was saying beforehand, uh, the 20, let's see, I moved, let's see, we lost, 2020 was like, I didn't get to see any college games. Uh, 2019 was my last year in Ohio, and that was not the strongest year necessarily there. Uh, the Mac was down a bit. I think it, was, it may have been the Dre Jameson year. Uh, Mm -hmm. was the top guy, but, uh, this year it's, I I can't recall the Mac in particular and, you know, the just right state is always its own little powerhouse, but, and the Mac is, uh, Sam Bachman. We have to start there, right? I mean, he's, he's going to probably go in the top 15 picks. Is that a a safe assessment to, to say, I mean, I know there's more risk, but if you're, Mm -hmm. let's put it this way, you know, we bet online as one of our sponsors. If you are gambling, you would bet (laughs) in the top 15, not after the top 15, right? Yeah, if I had to pick one of those, I would definitely take within the top 15. But I think that the safest range is probably in that kind of like 10 to 20 range. So somewhere in the middle of the first round, I would expect him to go. I mean, in, in some ways, I think of him kind of similar not, in very different ways, but kind of similar to Garrett Crochet a year ago. I mean, he's a guy with explosive, pure stuff. Who, If you put him in a big league pen right now, like we saw with Garrett Crochet, I think he would be able to get outs. Um, it's maybe the most explosive two pitch combo in the draft with a fastball that's routinely up into the triple digits and a slider that gets 70 grades at times. It's, it's probably one of the harder sliders in the class. Um, I think the, the risks and the questions with him are that it's not a great delivery. It's not a great body. There is some, um, some flags there that the teams don't necessarily love. It's not the loosest, most easy delivery in the world. And he does have some medical questions. He, uh, he dealt with some soreness, at times this year, missed a start. Um, but when he has pitched, he's been absolutely dominant. I mean, uh, like I was saying, the the two pitch combo that he has in the fastball and slider, I don't know that there's any individual pitcher that can match that. I mean, maybe if you're high on Kumar's fastball, uh, his slider is probably in the same neighborhood. But I think Bachman's fastball is pretty consistently better than Kamar's, at least in terms of velocity and bat missing stuff. Um, so yeah, he his if you like power arms. Um, Bachman is going to be one of your favorite players in this class, I would imagine. And I mean, you talked about you, uh, and I've mentioned as well, you, there is a thought that he could be like Finnegan or Crochet, right? That he's that guy that those two pitches give him a chance to succeed this year in the majors in a bullpen role, right? Yeah, certainly depending on the team that, that he gets drafted by, if there's a need right away and a team is competitive and just needs a, needs a bullpen arm that they can really feel good about, 
uh, and Bachman is healthy, then I don't see any reason why they they couldn't be pushed along pretty quickly. But I also think there there are probably a lot of lot more pitchers who could be pushed a lot more quickly than teams generally do. I understand that you don't necessarily want to start the clock on a first round pick immediately. I, I get that, but if it's a situation like the White Sox where you're competitive and you think a guy's ready, I mean, just in terms of pure stuff, Bachman has everything you would want from kind of a lights out or back of the ro- back of the bullpen uh, reliever. It's kind of an interesting thing you talking about that just made my the gears in my head mm-hmm. turn and twist, as it were. It's like spending a first round pin is probably cheaper and going out and acquiring a, a similar relief pitcher in with multiple years of control. While that guy mm-hmm. might be a little more of a sure thing. Uh, I've always been anti reliever early. I mean, that's just mm-hmm. one of my things, but there's kind of a weird logic where it's like a first round pick. You couldn't then turn around and trade like a mid first round pick for a good reliever. It doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, when the Indians went and got Andrew Miller again, Andrew Miller was someone completely high end top shelf. Mm-hmm. Uh, it cost them two of their top 10 and two more interesting guys. But a mid first round pick, if you can get a guy who's even like a seventh and eighth inning guy, that's probably a strong use of assets for a team that's looking to contend this year. Yeah, I think the other thing that's interesting about that conversation is is what does that do for the development of this player? If he is a guy who started and you do think he has a potential to start, I, I tend to agree with you just in terms of you don't you don't want a first round pick and say, oh, we got a reliever here. I don't, I don't think anyone is like super excited about that, whether or not the value matches up with just like historically what first round picks have produced throughout the first round. You could probably make an argument either way, but I think most teams want to get something that's more impactful. Although at the same time, bullpen uh, pieces have been more important um, in today's game than maybe 10 years ago. Um, But uh, yeah, my, my biggest concern would be does pushing him aggressively in a bullpen role at all, like prohibit his ability to start. I don't know enough about pitching development and like the mentality of each individual player that probably just differs depending on who you are whether or not that gets in your head or messes with your routine. But but I do think for guys like Bachman, and I said this for Crochet as well, who had similar reliever question marks, I would like them to be given an opportunity to start because if you have that pure stuff and you show you can handle a starter role, well, you're, you're much more valuable if you can start with that sort of stuff than, than being the, the back of a, a bullpen. So I do think Bachman has the ability to start at the next level and would like to see him given that opportunity as well. No, it's, I agree with you a hundred percent. And as you're talking, I, you know, I mentioned, as maybe we think about him where his best time in the majors was that time with Kansas city as a rookie. And he's never really found that consistency since, uh, speaking of left-handers it's again with the Mac, it's kind of crazy that you got a six, six lefty who's throwing in the lower to mid nineties. And he's the, the also ran the afterthought, uh, Joe rock at Ohio university. I was talking about on the show recently. I think he might be their best prospects since Mike Schmidt it's odd to see a guy who's that big and throws that hard you know not to say they don't show up in the Mac and Ohio Mm -hmm. University is a solid contributing team but that's not typically where you see the you know Miami of Ohio has put some guys out there Kent to Ball State Uh, OU is a little bit more off the beaten path in the Mac in terms of a a guy like that Uh, if you can just talk about Joe Rock and uh, you know what you've heard about or seen with him this year yeah, Rock was a guy who popped up last summer, I believe. He threw really well, showed really impressive stuff with the fastball that got up into the mid-90s and a slider that was pretty consistently given above average or plus grades. And when you've got a, a six foot six left-hander like that with that sort of stuff, you're immediately intrigued. Um, I think the concern was how many strikes was he going to throw? He had a history of walking guys at a pretty high rate, so that was the concern. Uh, I think he's pitched pretty well this year. He's probably in that second round consideration at this point with a, a group of college left-handers who who might go around that range. Some teams might like him higher. There was early chatter that that he could go in the back of the first, so it wouldn't be stunning if, if he were to go in that range. Um, but yeah, no, I think the, the two-pitch mix is really exciting. Uh, he doesn't have to live in the mid-90s uh, with his fastball and the extension and sort of the look that he gives hitters. Uh, he can live in the low 90s with his fastball and he should be fine. Um, and he's one of the better left-handed pitchers in this class. I mean, he's he's probably in that second tier that has a couple pitchers, including uh, Michigan left-hander Stephen Hajar and a few others. Um, I think Jordan Wicks is pretty solidly the top college left-handed pitcher in this class. But 
there are a number of good ones that I think we should be expecting to see go in, in that second or third round range. And, and Rock would certainly be one of the one of the first ones that you point to. Now, I know the traditional way would be to ask you about uh, Albright at Kansas State at this point, or Kansas State, Kent State. Ooh, getting my states confused. Uh, but instead of going there, I, the guy I'd like next in the state, just in terms of uh, college players, is Tyler Black at Wright State. Uh, I mean, Wright State has turned into a factory. Uh, it's, you know, Peyton Burdick is is a top 100 guy. I think almost most places are considered uh, in that talk. Let's at least put it that way. Uh, Seth Gray got a lot of money. Uh, Sean Murphy is, of course, with Oakland. Black, I like just looking at him on face level. On face level? No, that's not the expression <laughs> I want. <laughs> you know, just on a very basic level, he's going to be 20 until July. He's a Canadian kid. It's a cold weather, small school, cold weather, young for his class, uh, performing really well at an underrated uh, baseball factory. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, it, could you, you know, speak more to Tyler Black and uh, what he is showing or doing uh, in terms of uh, his own profile for this uh, draft? Yeah, Tyler Black is one of my favorite players further down the board in this year's class. He was, and it's partially because we had him as a sleeper, and he has certainly lived up to that tag. and And I don't take credit for that. It, it was scouts who tipped us off to him. We we reach out to scouts to to get those sleeper lists at the beginning of the season, and and he had a a pretty down year last year in the shortened season. Um, but again, if if you're talking with scouts, they they kind of know. They can see beyond just the the statistical results. They really liked his left-handed swing, his zone control. Um, and this year he has had the exact season that kind of scouts saw him being able to have if he got more time last year. He he is not the toolsiest player. He is not going to be like a premium defender, um, but he is a very, very good hitter. Uh, I think in his first game of the season, he matched up with Vanderbilt and hit a double to right center field against Kamar Rocker uh, and has pretty much continued to just rake the entire season. I mean, I think seven or eight of Wright State's hitters are hitting above 300, so the entire team is just mashing. Um, that team has is just loaded with with hitters who are performing. But Tyler Black just consult, controls the zone really well. At this point, I'm just kind of looking over his numbers. He's got 39 walks to 24 strikeouts, um, and it's not the best competition, but he does have a history of that really impressive zone control, and he has performed against some of the better pitchers when he's got a chance to face them. Uh, like I mentioned with Rocker, so it's in a class that is not super rich with college bats, this is one that you can probably feel pretty good about. He's probably not going to have a ton of power, but you can feel really good that he's going to be a consistent hitter for you day in and day out, play somewhere on the infield. Um, and yeah, he's, he's one of the more impressive Canadian players in this class. And, and my colleague, Alexis Brednicki, who, who hails from Canada, she, she really is uh, high on him as well. So yeah, I think Indians fans should keep an eye on him. Uh, just in terms of when you look at the the Carson Tuckers, the Ty Freemans, the everyone they've added up the middle hit profile, and then he also fits their age model. So I'll just mm. go ahead and throw that out there for Indians fans. <laughs> maybe, maybe if they're lucky and he's on the board in round two. I mean, I feel like I could be wrong, but I feel like he's a round two, round three, likely gone somewhere. Yeah, they picked yeah. what fifty eight in the second round. So I, That's I could right. see him still being available. I could also, I wouldn't also be surprised if he went a few picks no. in front of them. So it would be interesting. No, I totally agree. But yeah, he's. Uh, I, I like I said, I, I now I live in uh, Milwaukee, and mm-hmm. of course, Wright State was the one team in the Horizon League that did not come to town this year. <laughs> so I did not get to see him in person. Uh, Floyd from Youngstown State was the biggest uh, kind of draft player who came and he was really good in that one matchup. I got to see mm-hmm. him at peak, but uh, yeah, the horizon league is a little bit below the Mac this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, uh, but it's always fun to get out and check those out. I'll take our third break here and then I'm gonna come back and ask you a few questions just about uh, last year's draft class. So our first sponsor is built bar. I have heard people jokingly call uh, locked on the network, the built bar built. Uh, and okay, just the, the truth is I buy it. We got our first sample a year ago and I'm still buying this product. It's my health food app on my phone gives it an A grade. I find it to be delicious. I have I, you know, tried so many other companies. I shouldn't name names, but I've tried other companies. What just got bored, didn't love them. I still like Bilt Bar. I just got the grasshopper chocolate in the mail as something to try. It's the upside of hosting on the network. 
constantly getting random built bars yet i still buy from them it is such a delicious product it is good for you it tastes good go to builtbar.com use the promo code locked on 15 that gets you 15 percent off that's what i get as a customer a repeat customer they give me a code that's not that code but it's another 15 percent off code so try it out for yourself I've never had anyone who has bought it come back to me and be like, why did you advertise this? Or why did you push this so hard? Everyone likes it. Everyone loves Built Bar. Go to BuiltBar.com. Use that promo code LOCKDOWN15. Try it for yourself. And then BetOnline.ag. So normally this is the point in the show where I go over to BetOnline and I pull up the line for the Indians game. Today's game has already been canceled. Well, today, the day I'm recording, the Indians are going to reschedule that game. as a doubleheader on the 23rd. They have an off day Thursday. So there is no line to go check out. Bet online has you covered everything from sports to esports to uh, uh, politics. Even you can go and find what you're looking for. And when you go to Bet Online, use the promo code Locked On to get a five zero fifty percent bonus on your first deposit. It's you know free money essentially. Go check out all the stat, all the information for yourself with that. But you're gonna go use the promo code Locked On fifty to get a fifty percent bonus. And they have everything you can imagine. They have casino games they have like i said you can bet on politics you can bet on sports you can bet on was it like mixed martial arts well i know like that's now a big thing but not like just the uh the the uh stuff out in the octagons you can go bet on anything you can imagine you find it over at bet online check it out for yourself today so i wanted to bother you about this very small 2020 class or yeah 2020 class for the indians uh Going back to the days when I started, when it was still a 50 round draft last year felt like, well, first off, how odd did it feel to finish after five rounds? Didn't it feel like you're just supposed to get started at that point? It was, <laughs> it was, I didn't know what to do with myself when I was like, okay, we're done. Yeah, it was, it was really disappointing to be honest. I mean, because again, the 2020 draft, I think the biggest um, selling point for that class was the depth. And obviously with a five round draft that immediately gets cut off. You do you don't get to see any of that depth. Uh, obviously it trickles over into this year's class and there were uh, a few non-drafted free agents who signed who, who are going to turn into interesting players. But yeah, I just feel like I understand there's obviously a lot of, a lot of things that, that didn't pan out the way people expected with COVID. It's, it's not something you can really plan for. So I mean, it's hard to really blame anyone, but it is disappointing. It was such a short draft. I think 10 rounds would have been a much better solution, but um, it's neither here nor there at this point. I do think the Indians draft class last year felt as Indians as you possibly could have a draft feel. And maybe it is because with, with five rounds, literally every single player seemed to match their exact type. Um, maybe that's just the case for every team last year, but I, I got the sense that it was an Indians draft for them immediately. I mean, I think even on the broadcast, we're asked to highlight a few draft classes we really liked. And, and I really liked Cleveland's at the time, just because it, I, I like when teams identify what they do well in player development and match that up with their amateur scouting department. And really just, it, it's not like you're passing on players that are better. It's just, you know what you do well and you target those players and you just find success with them. And I, I would not be surprised if in a few years we see a lot of these players pan out because they're the exact player types and profiles that Cleveland has done a tremendous job with. So I liked it at the time. Um, and just based on some of the college players who are already getting into minors, it seems like they're off to pretty good starts. No, I think that's a, like a fantastic point is like knowing what you do and drafting for it. Cause you know, I, I, one of the big things on the show I break up all the time is in the last 20 years, the highest war outfielder they've produced is Luke Scott. <laughs> and the fifth highest war belongs to Ben Francisco. Uh, and then they spent about six years in the early uh, 2010s drafting nothing but outfielders in the first round, and they don't have a lot to show for it. Mm -hmm. And they took some high risk chances on um, some riskier prep arms, and we still don't know what's going to come yet. Uh, most of them have had an injury that has slowed their development. And this draft was exactly their type. Tanner Burns has already added a new pitch. Like it's been a month in since they drafted him. Oh, what did he, he add? Uh, I mean, he already had, kind of, but he's like got like a full on slurve now, like a really okay. well defined. Like he's they, he got together with them and is really kind of taking that slider and turned it more into like a full slurve. Nice. Uh, so yeah, and and he's throwing a cutter as well. I want to say they've worked with him on. I'm trying to remember if he had that beforehand, but yeah, no, he he had an interview recently. Um, where he's talking about some of that stuff. 
I, he also had my favorite quote, maybe where he talked about growing up an Alabama fan, but said, but I wanted to play pro baseball. So I went to Auburn, which <laughs> might be the worst burn <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> Oh no. Well, Auburn has but, produced a bunch of pitchers lately, so they have, he's not and wrong. You, get to, you get to work with Tim Hudson, which has got to be cool in and of itself when you go Absolutely. there. Absolutely. You know, to get a guy like that. Not that I mean, Dylan Smith is we could probably both spend some time talking about him. So Alabama's at least got some interesting talent. Not to, if there's any Bama fans out there, don't don't stop listening. Uh but yeah, it's uh Burns is is obviously really interesting. But whenever I talk to people, the name they want to bring up from that class is uh Everyone's starting to call him Logan T. Allen. I want to call him Logan Allen the Younger. It's just not catching on. <laughs> That's but, a good uh, one. I like that, actually. I'll help you push that into, okay. the, uh, Thank into you. the internet if you need. I, no, I, I could appreciate that. Yeah, I just feel like the Younger uh, isn't outside of like Roman history. We don't. It's use got some stuff. Game of Thrones vibes. Yeah, so exactly. I so <laughs> I, I think we could go with, but he's the guy a lot of people want to talk about. Uh, I, I mean, uh, my, my favorite random stat, and again, it's unfair because Garrett Mitchell got hurt. But I'm always like, hey, Logan Allen had more home runs in college than Garrett Mitchell, who got drafted before him. So, uh, <laughs> again, he got hurt and he had a, <laughs> he was developing. It, it's it's kind of like if I took a dig at Matt McLean, also a UCLA mm-hmm. guy, where it's like they had slow developmental curves and mm-hmm. they had injuries. It's it's not quite fair. Don't but like yeah, UCLA on this podcast, huh? <laughs> I have been kind of I have been kind of crappy to UCLA on this podcast yeah. just because of uh, developmental curves not being to my liking. Mm-hmm. Uh, them and then my history of pointing out that Brandon Geyer is the fifth highest war in Virginia history. You know, it's just <laughs> things like that that probably make uh, so I've offended Virginia, UCLA, and uh, in Alabama. So that's that's what that's what you do to lose listeners right there is go for the no, you're good the, the strong programs. But uh, yeah, uh, Logan Allen uh, praising Florida International is that yep, what he was? That's right. Uh, FIU, uh, not to ding them, but I'm not bringing back the the listeners from Virginia comparatively in size there. But if you don't mind talking about Logan Allen, like I said, he's the one that people keep bringing up uh, about how much they just like the basics, what's there, and Mm -hmm. specifically what's there for a team like the Indians with what they do with similar types of arms. Yeah, I think uh, just going back and looking over our draft report, but I remember at the time he was thought of as one of the, the more polished strike throwers uh, in the class, and and even going back to his high school days, he always had a track record of being a guy who was who was very advanced in terms of locating in the zone, understanding where to put pitches, um, mixing and matching. Um, and what what changed for him, I think, in college is that he took a changeup that was kind of a below average or fringy offering, and he turned that into a real weapon. And scouts thought of it as a plus pitch at the end of the day before the draft. Uh, obviously, the two way thing was interesting, but pretty much everyone we talked to thought his future was on the mound. I mean, a left-hander who runs his fastball into the 93, 94 mile per hour range, mostly sat in that 90 to 91 mile per hour range, but really the performance and the results he had was, was always really good. He never walked more than I think 2.7 per nine um, in his college career. And so far in the minors, it's, it's below two per nine uh, in a few starts this season. So I think he, he is that in, again, that, that pitcher that the Indians have found success with a guy who, doesn't necessarily have the best pure stuff right now, but has the command traits that seemingly you cannot teach pitchers or is very hard to teach pitchers or, or improve much more than, than what you just are able to do. Um, and it wouldn't be surprising to me if they helped him figure out a breaking ball that was maybe allowed him to have three above average pitches. I'm not sure what the, just looking back, I, I don't think he had a curveball that was more than just an average pitch. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me at all if the Indians were able to take that and and beef it up a little bit like they've done with some of their other pitchers. But um, again, one of the better left-handers in the class, if I'm remembering correctly, and just a guy who who didn't scream ceiling in the draft, but you could feel very safe that he was going to be a reliable pitcher for you at the pro level. And as soon as a team like the Indians took him, you just wondered, okay, what's he going to turn into now because of the success that they have had with pitchers of that type? So that's kind of what he was like. And, and Tanner Burns is similar. Uh, again, not not the most overpowering stuff. We we saw him as a a legitimate first rounder. Um, the Indians got him in the comp round, I believe. Um, but again, a guy who had some of the best command in the class. Um, really, really loud SEC performance throughout his entire career. Took the ball seemingly every week and just posted. Um, not the sexiest frame in terms of projection or size. Uh, or breaking stuff, but really good feel for for everything that he throws. Solid average across the board with everything. So I feel like those two are similar. 
although one is lefty and one is righty and, and one came from a power program and a power conference and one from a, a little bit smaller school, but both very similar traits, I would say. Yeah. And even Mason Hickman, who maybe has the least amongst like quote unquote stuff in that group mm-hmm. is also right in that line. They definitely, they went hard at their type, which is what you said. It, it's why I loved the group as well. I was like, you know, we could, Mason Hickman was the ace, not Kumar rocker. And it's like, well, maybe if the Indians get him to develop just a little bit more velocity or anything else, it's like, uh, he's the one I'm kind of most intrigued to watch this year, just because mm-hmm. if there's any sign of growth, that could be maybe the biggest steal for them in this class. Cause I mean, he dominated the sec. He dominated, he was about as good as it gets in as mm-hmm. good as it gets. And that was with stuff that really, I, you know, I don't want to say it's bad, but he, he stayed kind of consistent to where he was. I felt like when he arrived there uh, mm-hmm. and, he, but he, He's just such a cerebral, smart guy. He seemed ideal for them. Yeah, we. I think we put in his scouting report. I was just looking over it. Like he is not a guy who you show up to, and the first day you see him, you're like really wowed by him. But if you watch him consistently, he just performs every single game. You're just like, man, this this guy is really consistent. He really knows what he's doing. You can find louder stuff all over the country, but just in terms of putting everything that he has together. And, and working through a lineup and getting out, he's he's very good. And again, all these guys, just kind of looking over their line so far, have performed, and all of them have pr- pretty impressive strikeout to walk rates, which is what the what the Indians seem to be targeting. So it's working yeah, out for them before. I mean, you go back to the great class. I can't remember the year, but it's like that strikeout. Uh, you know, you look at their strikeout per nine, the walk per nine. It was that's the Savali, uh, Bieber, Andrew Landtrip was the kind of the forgotten guy because he got hurt and is out of baseball. Mm-hmm. And then police was also, he didn't quite have that line because he got hurt at ball state, but he was also part of that class. But uh, the last time they did that, not to say they're going to get another Bieber and Savali and police act, but uh, that was the last time they really kind of went with similar guys. So mm-hmm. I just applaud them for being aware. I think that's uh, an important thing. I, and, I promised. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and just to keep an eye for, for this year, we have um, UC Santa Barbara right-hander Michael McGreevy ranked number 23 and the Indians pick 23. So if he's there, I think that's that's a pitcher that, again, just shares all of these traits and maybe has more exciting like projection and pure stuff. So if he gets there, if he's on the board when the Indians pick, don't be surprised if they take him. I think he fits all the traits and he's super young for the class too. So watch mm-hmm. out for him. Yeah, if he gets past the Cubs, I agree. And they also have Kyle Nelson. So they got two, uh, two guys from that program already on their big league roster. So, you know, mm-hmm. they... They like it, so I, I think that's a great call. Uh, I had promised Carlos it'd only take about 30 minutes. We're at 43 right now, so I want to thank <laughs> him for coming on and giving me extra time. I know this is a hectic, busy time of year, so I don't want to hold you for too long. Uh, very quickly, not very quickly, as much time as you want. Tell them where they can find your work and where they can find you on Twitter. Yeah, most of my draft stuff, all my draft stuff is at BaseballAmerica.com. Um, so if you want to just check that out, uh, we appreciate everyone who subscribes and kind of lets us do what we do. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Carlos A. Colazzo, and then me and Ben Badler also start up a podcast this year, and that is the Future Projection Podcast. So those are the three best areas to find my work, to read the writing, and to listen to me and Ben talk baseball. But uh, thank you for having me on, man. This was fun. Oh, no, thanks for coming. And again, and Baseball America was like literally one of the first places I ever read when I was trying to find out about prospects. It's always worth your money. I recommend going there. Uh, as you can tell, Carlos is great on the mic, so go check out his podcast. And if you like the draft, even remotely, you should be following him. So go check out all three of those places. Uh, if for some reason you're listening to this podcast and not following me, you can find me at Jeff MLB Draft. And for the next year, maybe two, go Tribe.